This morning's reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 20 through 28. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he who holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Turn to the passage that John just read, Hebrews chapter 7. My heart is full this morning after baptism, and I'm looking forward to this opportunity to capstone and punctuate our time together by taking a deep dive into this section of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 7, verses 20 through 28. Let me start with a quote from the great British writer and Christian apologist C.S. Lewis. Lewis said once, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Now, I found that to be true. I agree with C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis, just so you know, he got saved later in life. As the story goes, he was on the way to the zoo with his brother. And when he got into the car to go to the zoo, he wasn't saved. But by the time he got to the zoo, he was saved. He put his faith in Christ. Lewis got saved as an older man. He was an atheist as a young man. I, like many of you, got saved early in life. I came to embrace the gospel in my childhood. But I'll just say that as I've grown and matured in Christ, I have had my eyes progressively open to God's revelation in our world and to see everything in our world through the lens of what Christ has done for us. Now, here's the author of Hebrews, and he's doing something like that. He's helping us see the everything else in our world. He's helping us see the everything else, namely the revelation from the Old Testament, in the light of Jesus Christ. He's helping us see the Old Testament in the light of Jesus Christ. He's helping us see the Old Testament priesthood in the light of Jesus Christ. He's helping us see the Old Testament sacrificial system in the light of Jesus Christ. He's helping us see God's plan of redemption in the light of the Son. What's the book of Hebrews about, Pastor Tony? If I could put it in a word, it's about Jesus and how he is better than everything that preceded him. The author of Hebrews is even helping us see how the great patriarchs of the Old Testament, how they should be viewed in light of the Son, because the Son is greater than Moses. He's greater than David. He's greater than Abraham. We've covered that already in the book of Hebrews. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than the priests like Levi and Aaron that were so central to the Israelite way of life. He's greater even than the Old Testament itself, the scriptures. Jesus is greater. Tell me, how many of y'all remember when Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees? He eventually said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. I'm the source of eternal life. 
Jesus is greater than the scriptures. He's greater than the Old Testament. In fact, he institutes a New Testament, a new covenant. The word testament is a word that means covenant. Our English word testament comes from the Latin testamentum, which is a translation of the Greek diotheke, which is a translation of the Hebrew barit, which means covenant. Jesus fulfills the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and he becomes the guarantor of a new covenant. That's what the author of Hebrews makes clear in verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant, a new covenant. In Hebrews 13, he calls it an eternal covenant. Jesus establishes something better than the Old Testament with all its laws and its priests. Those laws and those priests in that Old Testament point forward to Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. So I think, I think we've established already in the book of Hebrews, I mean, it's been a while since we've been studying Hebrews. And the author of Hebrews keeps offering us these better than arguments. Jesus is better than, better than, better than, better than. But I'll just tell you, he's not done yet talking about Jesus's betterness. There's three arguments in today's passage. Let's think of, talk, talk about Jesus Jesus being a better than priest than the Old Testament priest. Why is Jesus' priesthood better than the Old Testament priesthood? I'll give you three reasons. You can write these down in your notes. Here's the first. Jesus' priesthood is better because it is backed by an oath, says the author of Hebrews. Verse 20, and it was not without an oath, he says. It was not without an oath. What's the it in that verse? And it was, what, what's the it? Well, we've got to go back to the previous passage to ferret that out. Previously, the author said in verse 18, for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. The it of verse 20 is the reference to the better hope of verse 19. And that better hope is a reference to the priest according to the order of Melchizedek, namely Jesus, who has superseded and surpassed the priests of old. The author of Hebrews is continuing his argument, that argument, stacking up even irrefutable argument after irrefutable argument that Jesus is better. His priesthood is better than the Old Testament priesthood. And part of that is this oath. What oath are we talking about? Well, let's keep reading. And it, this better hope of Jesus' priesthood, verse 20, was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. That's true. The Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament, they had ceremonies, quite elaborate actually. They had rituals, but they didn't have an oath. God appointed them to be priests, but he didn't swear to them that they would be priests forever. They were priests for a time. I mean, how could he swear? They kept dying. You can't be a priest forever when you're dead. But this one, look at verse 21. So here's the contrast. That was then. This is now. This is Jesus. But this one, this Jesus, by the order of Melchizedek, was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Where's that found? That's Psalm 110, verse 4. That's David prophesying about a future Melchizedek who would come and be both a king and a priest. Jesus didn't just get a priesthood through Melchizedek, by the way, either. He got an eternal priesthood. And he got it with an oath from God the Father. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. That's the oath. You are a priest, not a normal kind of priest. You are a priest forever, forever. How can Jesus be a priest forever? Well, we covered that last time. Jesus' priesthood is energized by the power of his indestructible life. Chapter 7, verse 16. His, y'all remember that? Do I need to get amped up again to remind y'all about that? (laughs) Jesus rose from the dead. He's got an indestructible life. No other priest in the history of the world or in any other religion has that claim to fame. No priest has risen from the dead other than Jesus. And so Jesus is better. 
And that's why verse 22 says, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. It's, he's a living priest. He's a forever priest. Here's the question, okay? Here's, here's what you got to ask yourself. Do you want a living priest or do you want a dead priest? Which one do you want? Do you want a priest who's alive, who's alive and forever reigns as a priest and a king by the power of his indestructible life? Or do you want a substandard priest? That's the choice here for the readers of the book of Hebrews. And they, remember the context, they were being tempted to go back, back to that Old Testament way of life. They were tempted to go back to temple sacrifices and the Old Testament priests and the Old Testament covenant. I mean, the author of Hebrews is basically saying, why do you want to go back to that? Why would you? Jesus is better. In fact, he's saying it's stronger than that. You can't go back. There's no going back. Now that Jesus is on the scene, because Jesus is the guarantor of something better. Remember what Jesus said when he was talking about new wine and old wine skins? Y'all remember that? That's Matthew 9, Mark 2, Luke 5. You can't, Jesus said, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. Why? Because the chemical process of wine fermenting will blow up those old wineskins. You need wine, you need new wineskins for the new wine. You can't put the gospel of Jesus Christ into the old covenant. You've got to have the new covenant. You've got to have this Jesus as guarantor of a better covenant. By the way, this word guarantor is key. It's a Greek word that's only used here in the, in the entire New Testament, one time. And it's a word that means guarantee or surety. Y'all know that old King James word, surety, that we never use anymore, right? Or, or security or even pledge. Jesus, here's what's being stated here. Jesus secures or guarantees a better covenant based on a better hope, leading to a better future. Jesus is, in a sense, a down payment on our future inheritance. He has pledged it. He has promised it. He has guaranteed it. He's a kind of bondsman who's paid our bail bond. And we can count on that. In the Old Testament world, you know, the guarantor was a person who who guaranteed the position or endeavors of someone else while putting himself at risk, even. You remember there's that moment in the Old Testament where Judah, Judah wants to take his little brother back to Egypt, right, as Joseph was tricking them. And Jacob, who loved Benjamin and had lost, he thought Joseph didn't want his little son to go. And so what did Judah do? He says, you know, take me, I'll be the pledge. Take my sons even. I guarantee you that I will bring this son of yours back. That, that's the idea here, that you're invoking even some harm on you if it doesn't take place. Paul did something similar for the slave Onesimus in the book of Philemon. In this passage, the author of Hebrews is saying that Jesus, Jesus is our guarantor. He secures and guarantees the promises of the new covenant. Can we count on that? Not just a new covenant, but an, an internal covenant leading to a better future. Speaking of a guarantee and a better future, write this down as number two in your notes. So Jesus' priesthood, it's better because it's backed by an oath, Psalm 110. It's also better because of this, number two, it's guaranteed for eternity. Give me that. It's guaranteed for eternity. The author of Hebrews says in verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. They just kept dying. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus speculated that there were 83 priests that served from Aaron to the time of the temple in 70 AD and the destruction of the temple. 83, that number seems too low. And Josephus, by the way, is notoriously unreliable sometimes with his data. The Talmud lists over 300 high priests that served in that same time period. Even, even that number seems low, 300 people. Over that time frame, whatever the case, you don't have priests who continue in office forever. It's like the president of the United States. They retire and they die, and they don't last forever. And, and let's say you like your priest in the Old Testament world. I like priest Zadok. I like priest Moshe. I like priest Levi. Well, eventually they're going to retire and die, and then, I don't know, maybe their lousy son's going to become the next priest, and you don't like that guy. They don't have a perpetual priesthood because they keep dying and dying and dying. 
Not so, Jesus. That's the point, verse 24. But he, who's the he in verse 24? Here's another contrast. Jesus holds his priesthood permanently. He doesn't die, not again. He's a priest forever through the power of his indestructible life. And just think about that for a moment. You will never need another high priest as long as you live and on into eternity. That is great. R. Ken Hughes says it this way. Think of it. You will never need another high priest. No young, inexperienced priest just out of cemetery will ever succeed Jesus. Praise God for that. It's Jesus forever. Did I say cemetery? Oh, my goodness. Can we cut that out of the video later? I actually teach at a seminary, so I can't. Where was I? Good grief. Yes. Nobody will ever succeed Jesus as our high priest. Can I get an amen on that? All right. But Jesus, verse 24, back to verse 24. Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. You remember, there's that place in the book of Revelation where Jesus presents himself to to John on the island of Patmos, and he describes himself in this way. And it's, you might say, well, you know, Pastor Tony, Jesus died. Yeah, I know Jesus died. In fact, he really died. But, but notice how Jesus introduces himself to John. He says, you can read this on the screen. He says, fear not. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, right? And the living one. I died. John knew about that. He was there. I died, says Jesus, and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Yes, Jesus died. He really died. He didn't swoon. He didn't pretend to die. He really died, but he really rose from the dead with indestructible life. By the way, verse 24 has another reference to Psalm 110, which is amazing. Altogether, there are like four full references to Psalm 110 in the book of Hebrews. My my friend, I have a friend from seminary, Jared Compton, who wrote a book just on... Psalm 110 in the book of Hebrews. He wrote a 250-page book. You can go to Amazon and buy it. On just Psalm 110 in the book of Hebrews. That's how significant that psalm is here. And here it is again, another reference to to Jesus being a, a, a priest forever according to the prophecy of Psalm 110. And because of this, consequently, Jesus is able... Look at this. Don't miss this. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. He is able to say, Pastor Tony, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how bad a life I've lived. You don't know how many sins. You're right. I don't know, and I don't need to know. But I do know this. Jesus, no matter what you have done, is able to save to the uttermost. He is able to save completely. Those who draw near to God through him. That's an important preposition, through. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's amazing. That's amazing. Jesus always lives to make intercession for them. I mean, let's say you like your priest, priest Zadok, priest Moshe, Let's say you like, like father so-and-so down the street who, who intercedes for you. That guy is going to die. That guy doesn't live forever. He's not a priest forever. I'm not a forever pastor. When we get to heaven, I'm out of a job. This is the priest you want, and he's interceding for you. He lives for it. He always lives to make intercession for you. By the way, who's the them in verse 25? Let me read that again. Since he always lives to make intercession for them. Who's the them? That's the saints. That's us. Jesus is interceding for us. People get that confused. Like, who's doing the interceding? And and who are the saints? Don't we need to pray to the saints so they can intercede for us to God? No. No. We are the saints. And this says here that Jesus is interceding for us. 
Let me, let me just fill in. This is, y'all aren't marveling at this like, you, like I want you to, okay? So let me read verse 25 again. And I'm going to fill in all the pronouns, and, and I want you to feel it a little bit more, okay? Here, here's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Consequently, y'all ready for this? Consequently, Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Jesus, since Jesus always lives to make intercession for the saints. Are y'all feeling it now? Saints don't intercede for us. We are the saints, and Jesus, Jesus sits before God the Father, and he says, they belong to me. I died for them, my blood for them. They belong to us, and he's, this word, intercede, it even has the idea of prayer, builds into it, which is just shocking. Jesus praying for us, Jesus interceding for us. Some of you might say, well, if Jesus is interceding for us, do we need to intercede for each other? Do we even need to pray? Yes, you need to pray. But, but here's the thing. That the Bible speaks not just of God the Son, but also God the Spirit, who helps us in our times of prayer and intercedes for us even as we pray and helps us to pray the things we need to pray. See Romans 8 for more on that. There is a sense, y'all can amen this if you want, in which our lousy, feeble prayers before the Lord get cleaned up by God the Son and presented to God the Father. And even cleaned up by God the Spirit dwelling inside of us, showing us how we need to pray. The church father, John Chrysostom, he told a little story about this to illustrate this. He spoke of a young boy who wanted to impress his father with a gift. His father went away on a trip, came back home, and so his mother said, well, why don't you go into the garden, put a little bouquet of flowers together for your dad when he gets, and your dad will love it. The little kid goes out, and he gathers up some flowers, but he also, because he's not super knowledgeable about what he's doing, he also gathers up a bunch of weeds, and he brings it to his mama, and here's some flowers, and here's some weeds. And wouldn't you know, the mama, she took out the weeds, she put together a nice bouquet of just flowers. She interceded for her son before the father. She intervened, removing. And, and can I say it this way? Sometimes our prayers offered before the Lord are a bouquet of both flowers and weeds before the Lord. Are y'all with me? And there's a sense here in which Jesus interceding for us cleans that up and presents that to the father and this idea of Jesus interceding for us shouldn't shock us, praying for us even. Have y'all read John 17? Have y'all read the way in which the Lord prays for us, his disciples, the church in John 17? You know, people talk about the Lord's prayer all the time, you know, Matthew 6, 19, 6, 9 through 13. But that's actually Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. The actual Lord's prayer, where the Lord is actually praying for us, is in John 17. He's praying to the Father. He's, it's called the high priestly prayer by some people. He's actually praying, not teaching us how to pray, and he's interceding for us before God the Father. It's, it's remarkable. The, the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, intercedes for us. He prayed for us, and he continues in that work. I remember one time I was in Croatia with my brother-in-law, we went to church together in downtown Zagreb, and we parked a little ways from the Baptist church that we were going to, and as we were walking through downtown Zagreb, we came to this shrine, this Catholic shrine, and I remember just being, you know, bothered by this because it was all full of incense and icons. There were icons of Mary. There were icons of Peter. There were icons of these Croatian saints that I had never heard of, and these these people were bowing down and they were praying and they were asking these saints to intercede on their behalf. And, and I was, you know, back, I mean, this was early 20s, Tony. Even back then, I knew, why would I pray to these saints? Why I have direct access to God the Father through God the Son. Why would I go through them? Mary and Peter are rolling over in their grave thinking that people are praying to them. Peter's not a great high priest. Mary didn't raise from the dead by her indestructible life. She, like us, is a saint. 
that is saved vicariously through what Jesus Christ has done for us. And we can go directly to Jesus. He's our great high priest. He's the only one that has the power over death. And not only does he have that power, Jesus also has the power to save to the uttermost. Everybody see that in verse 25? Save to the uttermost. What does that mean? Uttermost is a translation of this Greek word, pantales. Pantales is a combination of both pos, meaning all, and telos, meaning the end. So the idea here is that Jesus saves to the end of all things. He saves completely and permanently to the uttermost, to the end. Any disagreement with that? Can I interest you in that? The problem here, here's the problem with the Old Testament priesthood and any priesthood in in our world. Old Testament priesthoods, or the Old Testament priesthood and the Old Testament sacrifices, they didn't save to the uttermost. They were shadows and pictures of the coming priesthood. They couldn't save forever. The blood of bulls and goats can't permanently take away our sin. That's the issue. Jesus, on the other hand, offers us permanence. He offers us eternal salvation. Any takers on that? Anybody got that? Look, if you have faith in Jesus Christ and eternity with him, you have everything you need, even if you don't have anything else. If you don't have that, you don't have anything, even if you have everything else. So his priesthood is a better priesthood. It's backed by an oath. It's guaranteed for eternity. Finally, here's a third reason that Jesus' priesthood is better. Jesus' priesthood is better because it is separated from sinners. Backed by an oath, guaranteed for eternity, separated from sinners. Look, watch this, church. This passage gets even better. How could this get any better, Pastor Tony? It gets better. Starting in verse 26. The author of Hebrews says, for it was indeed fitting. It was indeed proper is another way to translate this. It was indeed seemly or suitable. It was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. Phil Hughes in his commentary on Hebrews, he says this. You can read this on the screen. He says, the rendering of our version, it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, does not do full justice to the force of the original language which may better be translated, such a high priest exactly befitted us. That is to say, answered exactly to the requirements of the predicament in which we as fallen creatures were placed. Jesus is the perfect person to save us from our sins. It's almost like God had a plan all along to save us. For it was fitting indeed that we should have such a high priest Look at at these adjectives. Holy, innocent. Can you say that about any other priest in the history of priests? No. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners. Now, be careful with that one. That doesn't mean that Jesus, he doesn't associate with sinners. Jesus was called a wine bibber. Jesus hung out with tax collectors. Jesus was thought by many people to be, you know, hanging out with sinners. It doesn't mean he doesn't hang out with sinners. Aren't you glad? Because we're a bunch of sinners. It means that he's separated in terms of his being, in terms of his essence, in terms of his purity. He has no sin. He has no taint in him. And yet at the same time, holy, innocent, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. What? How can you have a priest that's exalted above the heavens? Priests have to be human. We looked at that already in Hebrews chapter 5. How can you have a human, a priest, who is exalted above the heavens? Well, Jesus is no ordinary priest. He is a human, but he's also the God of the universe. He created the heavens, and because of that, he's exalted above the heavens. So he's holy, he's innocent, he's unstained, he's separated from sinners, he's human, and at the same time, 
He's more than human. He's like us, but he's unlike us. By the way, just here, just a quick exegetical nugget here. This word holy, everybody see that in verse 26? There are two words in Greek that are used, that are translated holy. And I've talked about one of them, the more common one is hagios. Hagios, to be holy, because we are the, the hagioi, the, the saints. But this word, this is not hagios for holy. It's actually a rarer Greek word, hasios, which connotes something more explicitly messianic. So you and I can be holy in a way, in the way in which we're rendered and live our lives. It's a communicable attribute, but we can't be holy like this. In fact, Psalm 16, verse 10, in the Greek translation of that passage, it says, and, and those of you who are savvy Bible readers, you know Psalm 16, that's, that's a place that's quoted a lot in the New Testament with reference to Jesus' resurrection. It says, for you will not let your Holy One see corruption, your Holy One, hasias, with reference to the coming Messiah. Psalm 16 is, is quoted in Acts 2 and Acts 13 with reference to Christ. Christ is holy in a way that you and I will never be holy. Look at verse 27. This gets even better. He, Jesus, has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. See, the Old Testament priests, they had to do a little pre-sacrificing sacrificing. Before they could sacrifice for the people, they had to sacrifice for their own sins. They had to sacrifice and then really sacrifice. Jesus doesn't have to do that. Sinlessness doesn't require a sacrifice. It's even better than that. He, Jesus, had no need like the high priest to offer sacrifices daily. First for his own sins, then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. What does that mean? Look, this is so good. Jesus, Jesus doesn't offer up a sacrifice for himself. Jesus offers up a sacrifice of himself for us. The Old Testament priests had to do pre-sacrifice sacrificing because they were unholy. Jesus is holy. They were not innocent. Jesus is innocent. They were stained. Jesus is unstained. They were sinners. Jesus is separated from sinners. Jesus is qualitatively different in other ways, too. He's the God-man. He's the perfect one. He's the sinless one. He didn't have to offer up sacrifices for himself because there was no sin of his own to atone for. And this is where it gets even better. He didn't just offer up a sacrifice of a lamb, an innocent lamb or bull or goat. Because to be honest, that's not a long-term solution for man's problem of sin. Jesus didn't offer up a zoological sacrifice. He offered up an anthropological sacrifice. He offered up himself for our sin. You know, can I, let me just admit something real quick. I'm a bit of an Old Testament guy, so this might surprise you, but I, as I read the Old Testament, I really feel sorry for those poor animals who get sacrificed. Why did they have to die? I mean, they didn't sin in the Garden of Eden. We sinned. We brought all these consequences on our world. Why do the animals have to die for us? That's the point. That's the point. You see? They were the sinless ones. They were innocent. They were blameless. And their blood paid for us, sinful that we are. Now listen, here's the problem with the animal sacrifices. The problem isn't innocence. They had innocence. The problem was permanence. It wasn't lasting. Bring another bull. Bring another sheep. Bring another lamb over and over and over again. Jesus, on the other hand, offers us a sacrifice of both innocence and permanence. 
He's the once for all sacrifice. What did Jesus say from the cross? To tell us die. It is finished. It's done. Tell me if y'all have heard this before. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. We, right? Right? Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Spotless Lamb of God was he. Full redemption can it be. Hallelujah, what a Savior. By the way, this statement, once for all, when he offered up himself, that once for all statement is the reason we don't celebrate the Eucharist like they do in the Roman Catholic Church. Because in the Eucharist, as they celebrate, they sacrifice Christ again and again. And and you got to keep coming back to the table again and again and again. We don't Look, that is a misunderstanding, and I would even say a violation of what Hebrews says right here. Christ's work is finished. And we take communion here at church, right? We take the Lord's Supper. But we don't reenact the death of the Lord. We commemorate. We remember. Because it is finished. It's done. Look at verse 28. Let's finish this up. For the law appoints men and their weakness as high priests. Priests are weak. Priests are weak. The law made accommodations for them with all of their their ceremonial cleansing and their pre-sacrifice sacrificing. You don't need that with Jesus. For the law appoints men and their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later, Psalm 110, came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The oath came in Psalm 110, approximately 1000 BC, the days of David. The law came in 1400 BC. So 400 years after the law, this oath came. And the word of the oath, the logos of the oath, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Jesus has been made perfect forever. Now, I I need to explain that because actually some heresies have been birthed out of misunderstanding that. What does it mean that Jesus was made perfect forever? Does that mean that Jesus was imperfect and sinful and then he became perfect? No. No, we, we just read that Jesus is holy and innocent and stainless and sinless. He wasn't made perfect in the sense that he became sinless. He was made perfect in the sense that he was perfected as the sacrifice for our sins through his atonement. In the the progress of redemption, and then he was perfected as our high priest after his resurrection and ascension. You might say it this way, he was made complete, or his high priest status was finished or finalized. It's another way to translate this, this word, made perfect, teleao in Greek. It's related to that word, to telestai, teleo, that Jesus uttered from the cross. It is finished. It's done. This is Jesus. Church, he's he's the better than priest, offering up a better than sacrifice, instituting a better than covenant for us. And Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. And some of you might say, what, what does that even mean, a better covenant? Pastor Tony, you, you really didn't explain that enough. Can you expound on that more for us? Yes, I can, and yes, I will next week. So come on back, because Hebrews 8, Hebrews 8 goes into greater detail about this better covenant that Jesus establishes. Don't miss that. 
Let me close with this, and then we can sing a song together. So last time I taught on Hebrews, I referenced that Charity Bancroft song. I remember that song, Before the Throne of God Above. Great song. We sang it together. Interestingly, and probably not surprising for most of you, she wrote that song based upon her readings of the book of Hebrews. And I heard a story about it this last week. So there's a famous New Testament scholar named George Gunthry who was teaching a class on Hebrews, that's kind of his specialty, to a group of Jewish Christians in Israel. Sometimes we call them Messianic Jews, right? So here's this Gentile professor teaching a room full of Jewish Christians the book of Hebrews. And can I just tell you that it was, it was resonating with them. They loved every minute of it. And Guthrie wanted to kind of put a capstone on one of his lectures, and, and so he said, I want to sing this Gentile hymn together before the throne of God above. Great hymn written by this Irish lady. You're going to love it. So they, they sang that song, Before the Throne of God Above. This group, this group of Jewish Christians and this Gentile professor. And as Guthrie tells the story, he's like, it was, it was okay. I mean, it wasn't great. It wasn't like last week here at church. I mean, it was, it was okay. It really didn't resonate with them. But after they finished that song, one of the female Messianic Jews said, can we sing Ram Venasa Hamashiach? this great Hebrew song that they loved, and everybody in the room just celebrated. Ram ben HaMashiach means high and exalted is the Messiah. And so, so they, you know how it is sometimes when people sing songs in their native language, like their heart language? You know, some of y'all might resonate with that as you speak or sing in Spanish. I know my wife does when she sings songs in Croatian. It just like opens up a part of her heart that I don't always see. And that's how it was with this group of Jewish Christians as they sang this Hebrew song. They just belted it out. And this Gentile professor, he said his eyes filled with tears as he thought about the book of Hebrews that he had been teaching them in this room full of modern-day Jews that were singing and praising Messiah Jesus. It got me thinking. got me thinking about what, what might have happened 2,000 years ago, after the book of Hebrews was delivered to the audience. What did they do? I don't know. There's no book of Hebrews part two. I don't know. But maybe, just maybe because of how direct this message is, maybe they were cut to the quick about how great and awesome Messiah Jesus Christ is, and they repented and recommitted to the Lord. I don't know, someday we'll find out in eternity, I guess. And maybe we as a room full of mostly Gentiles will never totally understand what it's like for a group of Jews who receive this letter. I think we can get a sense of it. I think our eyes can maybe even fill with tears. We can't totally understand the situation of the the people who first read this letter. But I think we can understand just how precious Jesus is to Jews and Gentiles both. And I think we can understand how precious the gospel is. Because the gospel is as the Apostle Paul says, the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Right? Do you believe the gospel? Pray with me. Lord, we testify this morning to our faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
the Messiah, the God of the universe who died for our sins, the one who rose from the dead. And Lord, we have a living high priest who intercedes for us. That is so good. I don't even totally understand that, Lord. And I have yet to plumb plumb the depths of the riches of the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for me. I don't understand it all, Lord, but I believe. I believe. Jesus, you are our Savior. You are our Messiah. We worship you. This church is your bride. We belong to you. And we love you, Lord. Words fail me. I don't have the right words to articulate how precious you are to us. But with everything that is in me, I will try to speak of you and sing of you and testify before the world that Jesus is my Lord, my Savior, my King, my High Priest. Lord, we're here today as your church on the day of your resurrection Sunday to celebrate you, to worship you, to praise your name. Two people today have been baptized, Lord. That's your work. We praise you for that. 